All right, have a seat. Well, we'll start out on this special Resurrection Sunday morning like we always do. He is risen. All right, you're doing better. Back in the day, all you Baptists, I would say, he's risen. You're like, amen, yes, he has. So this, this greeting goes back thousands, probably several thousand years almost. Um, he is risen, the pastor would say. He is risen indeed. The congregation would respond. So you're doing good. You're doing good. Thank you, Daniel. All right, Acts chapter 9, we're in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you're like, oh, man, I don't have a Bible. There is a blue one, hopefully a blue one, somewhere close to you. That's our gift to you. Um, it is page uh, 1016 in that uh, Bible. And we're going to be in Acts 9. We're going to pick it up in verse 19, but just put your thumb in there for a second. Uh, but welcome to Point Harbor's Resurrection uh, Sunday service. We had a great service last night, packed house, amen. Uh, I think at, at least 15 people trusting Christ as Savior. So yeah, so that was, uh, oh, oh, speaking of, uh, of, well, not speaking of that, but speaking of gifts, a gift of salvation, we also have a gift of Point Harbor. If you, um, we do this every uh, uh, Easter I think, and sometimes Christmas. We want to bless you here, say thank you for coming, but not all of you. We can't afford that. So we have, to, <laughs> we have two $50 gift cards, uh, and in order to get it, you have to take out your device and click on the QR code that's in the seat back, I think, in front of you, right? Click that, and then somehow it guides you through uh, so you can sign up for that. And at the end, Pastor Johnny will come back and tell who the... Two, I don't believe in luck, but let's say blessed people are. Amen? $50. So if you're like, I don't need $50, then don't do it. Huh? That, <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, but I have been here um, for, uh, what, going on 25 years as your lead pastor. And many times at Easter, I'll bring a special, you know, Easter message if we're in a series, I'll interrupt the series and do an Easter message, then get back to the series. But this year, after praying about it and looking at it, I decided to just roll with what we've been doing, um, it, you know, and, and kind of give those of you who are visiting here for the first time a taste of what Point Harbor is, you know, because years ago we used to, <laughs> we used to do Easter cantatas. Anybody remember Easter cantatas? where you would put on a big production, sometimes a play, a drama with some music. I remember one time we did, and we, when we first came back here, Pastor Jerry and myself came back here, and we spent hours and hours doing this thing, 45 minutes of music, 45 minutes of music that only we knew. It was new music. So if you're new, you didn't know it, and you stood for 45 minutes, and then a short message and, and one of our ladies came up, one of the pastor's wives, she says, you know what, Pastor John, I just wish that when I invited folks to come in, they would see what they would get at a normal Sunday instead of this because, you know, my, my friends aren't going to come back after standing for 45 minutes singing songs they don't know. I'm like, duh. So this is, uh, this is what, uh, you know, typical. We don't have the choir every time, but we do sometimes. Amen. Do you appreciate the choir? <laughs> Amen. If you're, you say, I want to be in that choir, see Shelby. See Shelby, all right? Uh, but we are in a series in the New Testament uh, of, uh, on the book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts, that is, uh, we're calling Church on Fire. Church on Fire. And you'll, if you read the book of Acts, you understand what that means, you know? I mean, that was a church on fire for God. And it's cool because it's helping us at, at Point Harbor to kind of compare where we are with uh, where we're supposed to be and make necessary tweaks. And we've been making some tweaks, right? Been learning some things, putting them into practice, hopefully. And uh, so this first church in Jerusalem wasn't perfect, but it was an amazing church, the church that Jesus founded. And we want to be an amazing church, right? Not for us, but for Jesus. So we don't just mess around, you know, and, and just phone it in. And it's, it's uh, but, but listen to me, folks. A lot of churches have moved a long way from the church at Jerusalem. A lot, I'm not talking geographically. I'm talking theologically. There's a whole lot of churches that don't even preach this morning. They're, they're preaching, you know, I don't know what they're preaching because they don't believe the Bible. Some of them don't believe the resurrection. I mean, so why show up? You can sleep in. I don't understand that. And others have turned into, now there's a lot of good churches around. 
but others have turned into Christian country clubs, uh, you know, just kind of, hey, it's, you know, us four and no more or whatever, uh, the frozen chosen. So we don't want to do that. And, and, and let me give you first-time guests, uh, let me let you in on something, all right? And that is we're not putting the dog on for you today. We're not. What you see is what you get. Somebody asked me, you know, are you going to dress up? And I said, yeah, this, <laughs> this is, unless you die and I'm doing your funeral and you, you know, say, I really want you in a, in a suit. And I typically do funerals in suits uh, and weddings in suits. And that's about all the suit wear. And I got one suit and it doesn't even fit anymore. So, so don't die. Okay. That's the, don't die. But what you see is what you get. All right. <laughs> for good or for bad. But, but here's what Point Harbor is. Point Harbor is a Jesus-loving, Bible-preaching, sinner-reaching, Word of God-teaching church. And we're, yeah, and we're not woke. We're spiritually awake. Amen? And, and we're not politically correct. All right? We're not. We're biblically correct. And or we, we seek to be biblically correct, uh, which many times smacks against politically correct. We're not here to worship Pastor John. We're here to worship Savior Jesus. And he is at the core. Jesus at, is at the core and the center of what we are to do. Not me and not you. So sometimes you might not like things, you know, but it's not about you. If we're preaching the word of God and the word of God is a buzzsaw in your life, sorry. You know, you need to wake up, smell the coffee, and maybe repent. And me too. So you're like, hey, John, that's cool, that's cool. You know, I'm cool because I'm a Christian. All right, can I say something and not hurt your felons? On Easter morning, can I? A few of you say yes. Yeah. Some of you lie. I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you What do you mean, John? What do you mean? Saying you're a Christian, I'm a Christian, and you may be, you may be, but that is the easiest cultural appropriation out there. It really is. All this. You, what do you mean? What do you mean? Cultural appropriation. That's a big no-no nowadays, right? Amongst the politically correct folks, we got Cinco de Mayo coming up. Uh, in May, Cinco de Mayo, the 5th of May. And so you want to celebrate Cinco de Mayo, so you go out for margaritas with the office folks, and God help you if you put on a sombrero and you're a white dude. <laughs> you have just appropriated Mexican culture. How dare you, sir? <laughs> That's the world's all big about that. And some of you members who bought, brought guests today, you're a little bit nervous right now. I'm like, oh no, he's doing it on Easter. I thought he'd be good on Easter. <laughs> Cultural appropriation. And, 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 but here's where I'm going. Some of you have culturally appropriated Christianity. You've culturally appropriated it because you're not really it, but you say you're it. You've culturally, you know, is your culture growing up? It's the culture of America somewhat now, but it was your culture growing up, you know, you went to church, so that means you're a Christian. You didn't go to the mosque, so you're not an Islamist, you know. You, you didn't go to the, the Hebrew temple, so you're not a Jew, you're, so it must be a Christian. So you've culturally appropriated your Christianity, but you're not really a Christian, some of you. And I'm not mad at you, you know. I, I, I used to be you. I used to be you. So today's message is, is all about how you can get the real thing. And the cool thing is, as I laid out the book of Acts, this wasn't me planning amazingly, but this passage that we come to, we've been in the book of Acts for, this is the 18th week, and we come to this passage, and then as I looked at it, I'm like, wow, Lord, look what you did there. Look what you did there for Easter. This is perfect. Uh, so the message today is really simple. It's going to be a simple message, but it's a huge truth. You're a Christian? Prove it. You say you're a Christian, prove it. Go ahead and prove it. Well, I don't have to prove anything to you. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I, I get that. This is 2024, you know. Nowadays, you can identify as something you're not, right? And, and, and we're not supposed to say anything, even though everybody can see the truth, all right? A dude can identify as a lady, and people are like, no, that's, you called her a him. Well, her is a him. Well, you can't say that. I just did. I, because I got eyeballs. I got eyeballs. But you're not supposed to do that. A teen can identify as a furry. I don't even know what a furry is. It's like, 
you dress up like a cat and meow and identify as a cat. And I'm like, that's just weird to me. I mean, when we did those things, we were stone drunk. <laughs> we never did it sober. <laughs> and an unbeliever can identify as a Christian. Then we don't say anything. You're not supposed to say anything. Even though sometimes some people are like, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think you're a Christian. Well, you're not supposed to judge. The Bible says we're to judge righteous judgment. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruit. So your root we can't see, but your fruit we can see. And some of you, you are fruitless. I'm not just talking about you new folks. I don't even know y'all. I'm talking about some of my folks. I'm talking about some of you scallywags. Some of you folks that say, Point Harvest, my, yeah, Pastor John, I really like him when he's funny. When he goes so long, I don't like that as much, but I like it when he's funny. All right, some of you, you're identifying as something you're not. Well, John, where in the world are you going with this? I'm just trying to get your attention. Have I got it? Okay. Those of you who are identifying as Christians, but you're not a Christian, I, 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 man, this passage is all about you. This passage is all about you. I, I, because here, it is all about me. I identified as a Christian for 19, 20 years. And, and I, I was sincere. I thought I was. Born in a Christian family, you know, so I got the culture of Christianity. And, and went to church, drugged to church. Went to church, didn't want to go to church, but I was drugged to church. Had to go to the youth camps, whether I wanted to or not. Had to participate in vacation Bible school, whether I wanted to or not. All that stuff. I was sprinkled as a baby, you know. I didn't have any vote in that. Had to go through catechism class, was which was the most boring class in the world. Had to answer in front of the elders all the answers, you know, to make sure that I was really a Christian. They gave me the, you know, good housekeeping seal of approval. But I was not. And, and if I'd have died when I was out driving drunk like I used to do like an idiot, I mean, stone blitz driving places, if I'd gotten knifed in a, in a fight, you know, in one of those bars in Marseille, France, or over in some seedy joint in Ocean View, I would have died in locked eyeballs with Jesus and heard him say, like he says in Matthew I never knew you. John Houston, never knew you. In the Greek, that's the word hudepo, which means never formally at any time, at any level, in any capacity did I know you. It wasn't that you were a Christian and then you did some bad stuff and I took your salvation away. No, that's not how it works. I never knew you. You had religion. You had maybe baptism. You didn't have me. And that would have been, I mean, it would have shocked me to my heels. And there are, there are thousands, you know, if not millions of folks dying every month from planet Earth who are shocked. Hell is filled with, with religious well-intentioned, for the most part, people. Very few Hitlers and all in hell. Hitler's there. But there's a whole lot more folks that end up shocked Jesus would tell me, you identified as one of my kids, but, but you've never been my child. You, you, you appropriated my, my name, but you never, ever received my nature. You don't want that to be your case. That's what this message is all about. That is how God has set it up. Some of you that came, maybe, maybe you didn't want to come, and right, like you're, right now you're like, oh, man, I wish I hadn't come. Hang on. Hang on. This is for you. All right? Holy Spirit's doing something in your life, so, so hang on. You, you don't want that to be your case when you die. So let's see it in our Bible text. All right, now, back to Acts chapter 9. Hopefully your thumb is there, verse 19, page 1016 in that. And I don't know if I told you, the blue Bible is yours, our gift to you. Take it home, write your name in it, bring it back next week, all right? So, Acts 9, we pick it up halfway through verse 19. Are you there? Say, I'm there. Yeah. All right. Oh, let me give you the context first, all right? Because if you're, if you're just new to this thing, you're like, okay, and you'll, you'll not totally understand. This, this is the, uh, the Damascus Road experience. And many, you know, people who aren't Christians, they, it's kind of a term, it's the Damascus Road experience. It's when you, you are totally radically changed, something just boom, changes you. You've had a Damascus Road experience. Saul is this dude, he's super religious, super trained, he hates Jesus and all things Jesus. 
And so he hates the church. Now Jesus dies on the cross, goes to the grave, and then three days later is resurrected. We're celebrating that this morning. And so Jesus then ascends into heaven after 40 days, and he leaves the disciples saying, hey, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. All right, start here, but also do it around the world. And so they, they said, all right, okay, we're going to do that. Well, Saul is thinking like all the Jewish leaders, all right, this Jesus dude is dead. All right, they say he resurrected. We don't know. We don't care. We're just trying to minimize that. Hopefully now all of his followers will scatter. Well, scatter they did, but they also scattered preaching the word of God and sharing their faith. And that's ticking Saul. So he's like, I'm going I'm to get him. And he was kind of a muckety-muck. And he uh, got some permission from the authorities to go to Damascus. He heard there were a bunch of Christians that took off over there and were planting a church over there. I'm going to go to Damascus. I'm going to arrest them. I've got these warrants. And then we're going to bring them back. And some of them hopefully we'll kill. But at least we'll jail them. He hated Jesus. He hated Christians. So he's going along on the way to Damascus, riding something, probably a horse. And all of a sudden a light shows out of heaven. Bam! Super bright light, knocks him off his horse, and he hears this voice, says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, what? What, what, what? Who are you, Lord? He goes, I'm Jesus. And then you don't see it, but it's like, you idiot? <laughs> You're persecuting me. And it blows him away. This Jesus, that he's been persecuting Jesus' followers, is knocking him off his horse, and he sees him. He sees a vision. You can see in the text in a little bit, but it's so bright with Jesus' glory, it basically fries his eyeballs or puts stabs on his eyeballs, and, he, and he, so he's, he can't see for three days. He goes the rest of the way into Damascus, led by the hand, and now he's like, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. I bet, oh, my goodness. And so he repents in that process of time, trusts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And that's where we pick it up in verse number, what did I say, 19. 19. For some days he was with the disciples. So, so he, uh, well, we'll go to 18. Go to 18. Uh, this dude comes and prays over him. Hey, Saul, uh, I want you to be, regain your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and then he rose and was baptized. Now, interesting, he was baptized before he took food. He hadn't eat or drunk in three days and he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. So now he's hanging around these folks. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he's the son of God. He used to say he's a heretic. Now he's going, ha, he's the son of God. Wow. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the Saul dude, the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? To, uh, of those who called upon this name, has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength. So he's growing as a believer and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Because Saul was someone who'd been trained by Gamaliel. He knew the Old Testament. He just never put it together. And all of a sudden, tick, 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 all these prophecies like, oh, wow, dude, whoa, that is Jesus. I see it now because he's got spiritual sight. Verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Probably looks something like this because you're like, that's kind of weird. Yeah, but on the walls, they had some of these places where you could receive the goods, you know, and not have to open the big gates. And so they just woo, snuck him out that away. And so they snuck him out uh, in a basket. And when he'd come to Jerusalem, <laughs> now look at this, this is our message. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, for they did not, you ought to underline this, they did not believe that he was a what? Disciple. But Barnabas, God loved Barnabas. Barnabas means son of consolation. He was an encourager, right? Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he, Saul, had seen the Lord who had spoke to him. So he'd seen the Lord, not just the light. He saw the Lord in the light. And how at Damascus he'd preach boldly in the name of Jesus. Not only did he have this, you know, meeting of Jesus, but he also, you know, started acting on it. His life's changed. So he went in. Saul went in and out among them at Jerusalem. He had access to the church. He was there all the time preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. These are Jews who speak Greek. They had their own uh, 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 synagogue. But they were 
seeking to kill him. I mean, they're always trying to kill Saul. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and then sent him off to Tarsus, which is where Saul was from, all the way up north, north of Israel. And so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Now, so that's your context. Our, our boy Saul meets Jesus in an amazing way, and his life is radically, radically changed. And after about, this is a period, it doesn't say here, but in other contexts we can tell it's about a three-year period. Well, this just didn't happen, you know, and then next week this happened. Three-year period that he was in Damascus, he decides to come back to Jerusalem. All right, I'm going to come back to Jerusalem. I'm going to come in there, and, you know, they probably heard my testimony, and they'll receive me, this church, you know. And the church says, no, ha, we don't believe you. We don't believe you. And don't judge them. Don't judge them because you wouldn't either, probably, right? I mean, last time they'd seen this guy, he was a fire-breathing hater of all things Jesus. In, uh, in Acts 9, in verse 1, it says this, but Saul, still breathing, this is before he met Jesus, threats and murder, I want to kill him, against the disciples, went to the high priest, asked him for letters, so that if any, he found any Christians, he might bring them back bound to Jerusalem to throw him in prison or hopefully kill him. So this dude, who was bringing the persecution, uh, uh, arrested them, arresting them, taking them to court, having some put to death. This dude wants to come and worship with us now? Wants to join our church? No way, man. I ain't having it. It's a trick. Some kind of a trick. You know, there's no way that God could change anybody that much. It's some satanic psyop. That's what they thought. That's what they were thinking. We have, uh, uh, if you haven't joined and the Holy Spirit's telling you this is your church, then you ought to jump on that. Uh, April 24th is coming up. Our next members who are coming in. And we get a lot of people joining, and it's awesome. And I don't know if you've noticed, you got to look around. Look around at the people around you. Look at them. Look at them. All right, look side to side. All right, there's some people that don't look like you. There's some folks in here who have skin pigmentation that's different than yours. Oh. <clears throat> I've heard people say, what kind of a church do you have? Is it a white church? I'm like, what, what's a white church? Well, you know, it's white. It's all white. Oh, no, we're not that. Well, is it black? They don't ask me if it's a black church because I'm white. <laughs> Those two don't go together for some reason. What kind of a church is that? It's a church. It's a church that reflects the community. Man. So in our community, yeah, we got white folks, we got black folks, we got brown folks, we got Asian folks, we got folks who don't know what they are. <laughs> so that's kind of us. So we're a multicultural church, amen? And I love it. I love it. I love it. But, 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 but. Membership Sunday, April 24th, what would y'all do if we put the pictures of the new folks coming? All right, these folks are coming to join, you know, and it's always a lot of pictures. And you see up there, and now if you're a member, stand to your feet, and all the members stand. And uh, if you're affirming these people as new members to come in and join, and, and then raise your right hand and say amen, amen. And you look, though, you look close, and there's a, there's a picture. You're like, isn't that David Duke? The, 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 the former grand wizard of the KKK? Isn't that David? He, he moved, I heard he moved up here. Is he joining Point Harbor? Huh? Some of you are like, uh oh, uh. The first time in the world you go, I vote against him. I vote against David. And, and, and there'd be nothing wrong with that. Because, I mean, David Duke, I, I don't know the man, never met the man, don't necessarily want to meet the man, but he's done a lot of bad things. He's a racist extraordinaire, at least last I heard, right? But let's say he got saved and he's like, oh, I'm repentant of all that. Still, you all have a bunch of problems. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What would you say? David, you got to prove that thing, man. You got to prove that thing. All right? They, and, and this church is the same way. They weren't buying it. They weren't buying it, man. They were basically saying, you, you say you're a Christian, prove it. Prove it. By the way, David Duke's not joining. <laughs> Just want to. Some of you, it's funny how it's, you, you folks hear me say things sometimes. We had one time that I, I'm getting off. But anyway, this lady left the church, and, she, and they were going like three years, and she came back. You know, she, and she left like a lot of people leave. You know, when they leave, like, doo, 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 doo. they don't say, they don't come to me. They're just, they're gone. I'm like, are they gone? They're gone. You know, try to contact them. You can't contact them. Whatever. Okay. She comes back. She goes, you know why we left? And I said, why'd you leave? Because we were doing a membership class. They were rejoining. And she said, because you said this. And I'm like, I don't believe that at all. I believe exactly the opposite of that. 
Well, my father heard you. Well, your dad needs hearing aids because I didn't say that. <laughs> so sometimes some of y'all hear me say things, so I just wanted to let that let you know. No David Dookie. <laughs> All right. You say you're a Christian, prove it, prove it. Look at this. <clears throat> In this context here, when, when they, they come to Jerusalem, uh, he attempted to join. Let me get this up here. He attempted to join the disciples. I want to join y'all. And they were afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. They didn't believe it. There's nothing wrong with that. What do you mean there's nothing wrong? Some of you are like, John, you ought to always believe. When people say they love Jesus, you ought to believe that. No, you should not. 1 John 4, do not believe every spirit, <laughs> but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many, what? False prophets have gone out into the world. Satan tries to send them into the church to delude and pervert and, and distract and divide the church. So no, you shouldn't. They were doing right. Now, ultimately, they accepted him and they did it the right way. But, you know, if, if somebody killed one of your relatives... And they said, hey, everything's cool. I got right with Jesus. You probably wouldn't believe them. Even in court, you know, if they say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, no, I, I don't know. I, 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 I got to see this thing. So any church and any church leadership has to be careful on that. Had a guy last year uh, who was just out of prison. And one of the, one of the uh, folks in the foyer, one of our greeters said, hey, this guy wants to talk to you. We're sitting over in the corner. I sat down. And... I said, yeah, and he goes, and he told me, he said, I'm just out of prison, I've been in prison for how many years, and what he did was pretty, you know, it was, it was heavy stuff, and so he said, but I, I, in prison, I got saved, man, I met, the, I met the Lord Jesus, and he was quoting scripture, quoting scripture, I, you know, I was like, wow, he, he knows his Bible, and so I told him, you know, and he was understanding, but I, I said, hey, that's awesome, man, that's cool, that's an awesome story, and I want to believe you, but I don't know you, man, this is the first time we've met, so you're going to have to, to, to over time, prove your salvation to me. You can come, but we're going to keep an eye on you. He knew that because of what he did. We won't keep an eye on him. There's a certain place he could not go because of that. Because, I, sorry, dude, I, I don't, you know, love your story, but I've been lied to a lot as a pastor over 35 years. Been lied to a lot by a few of you. Now, from... <laughs> That was free as well. <laughs> now, some of you are sitting there, you're looking over, you're going, that fellow on the left looks sketchy. I wonder if it's him. <laughs> as far as I know, he's never been back. Okay? So, I'm not saying he, but if he came back, we'd have, we'd have that same sit down. All right? So, you say you're a Christian, prove it. Prove it. And that goes for anybody. Not just ex-cons, goes for me. I, I'm <laughs> When I was in the Navy, I was in the, on the mid-watch, USS San Diego, down in the boiler room. And on the mid-watch, those of you that have been in the military, you know, the mid-watch, you talk about everything because it's just boring. You're eating your mid-rats, which are junk, and you're, you're you know, just talking about whatever to, with anybody who will talk. And so you talk about sports until you're done with that, and you talk about home until everybody's sick of that. And then it usually ends up coming around to religion. It's like last on the list, but you talk about religion and and they were talking about religion, and I don't know how it came up, but I thought that I needed to say, well, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm a Christian. And this I see in third class, he just turns to me, and he goes, I would have never, I can't, I'm shocked. I would have never thought that you, Houston, were a Christian. And you know what? I wasn't. I was identifying. I thought I was. I wasn't trying to be deceptive or deceitful. I just, you know, I was identifying. I was appropriating the Christian culture. So now from this text in, uh, on Saul in Acts chapter 9, we're going to give you four points that are going to come at you fast, all right? Say fast. Yeah. All right, proof number one. These are biblical markers, biblical evidences of my spiritual reality. Proof number one, all right, if you got these proofs, doesn't mean you're a Christian for sure, but a Christian ought to have these proofs, all right? Number one, I've got a testimony of meeting Jesus. I've got a testimony of meeting Jesus. And many of you don't. You got a testimony of church membership, testimony of baptism, maybe, testimony of, you know, going in the, the youth group when you were growing up, testimony of taking communion. In, in Acts 9, Paul, or Saul, they call him Saul at this time, he has a testimony of, of, uh, of meeting Jesus. It says here in uh, verse 26, 
you know, they, he tried to join them. They were afraid of him, didn't believe him. But Barnabas, God love him, took him and brought him to the apostles, to the leaders. Didn't bring him to the whole church. Brought him to the leaders and declared to them, the leaders, how on the road he, Saul, had seen the Lord. Hey, this dude has a testimony of meeting Jesus. Jesus did an amazing thing. So he says, hey, I know this guy has been the, the, our biggest persecutor. I, I know that he said horrible things about us and done horrible things to us. This dude helped kill our buddy Stephen Deacon, you know, Deacon Stephen, who was related to some of you and friends with all of you. I know that. But man, this guy now, he's got a testimony of meeting Jesus. And I believe it, man. I, I believe he's a believer in Jesus. I believe he's a follower in Jesus. It, 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 he, he believed Jesus... Saul had believed when he wasn't a Christian that Jesus died on the cross. You could not not believe that. Oh, Jerusalem was full of it. He believed that Jesus was buried, right? They were all about that, but he didn't believe in the resurrection. Oh, that was fake. That was, I don't know what that was. That wasn't real. Now he has seen Jesus. He believes in the resurrection because he met Jesus. Amen? You say, well, John, you know that. It's cool. I, I've always been a Christian. <laughs> no, you haven't. I have people say that to me every once in a while. I, I want to be kind. I really do. I'm, I'm actually a very kind, wonderful, compassionate man. <laughs> Till I get up here. But no, you haven't. You haven't always met Jesus. It's like saying, I've always been alive. No. No. It, it, listen to me. This is imperative. This is imperative. If I haven't been born twice, I'll certainly die twice. If I haven't been born twice, I will certainly die twice. What, what in the world, what, what are you talking about, John? Revelation, it, one of the, the scariest passages in the Word of God, talks about who's going to hell. All right? So check yourself on this. Check yourself. But the cowardly, I ain't no coward. Okay, cool. The faithless, oh, that's not me. The detestable, I don't think that's me. <laughs> Murderers, never killed anybody. Sexually immoral, move on. Sorcerers, that's the Greek word pharmakia, from which we get the word pharmacy, so that means that's all you stoners. Idolaters, but look at this, and all liars. How many of you have lied before? All right, some of you didn't raise your hand, you lied in church. That makes you a liar. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the what? Second death. That's the second death. If I haven't been born twice, I will certainly die twice. Christians, real, genuine believers will die. We're going to die. I've done a lot of funerals. We're going to die once and then have real life, eternal life in heaven. We die once, and that's really our, our doorway into heaven. Folks who are not real Christians will die and then face what the Bible calls the second death, eternally in hell. That's heavy. Some of you never, never heard that, seen that. You think that everybody goes to heaven as long as they're sincere, as long as they're nice, as long as they pet puppies. That is not true. There are a lot of puppy petters in hell. Yeah. A lot of religious folks, a lot of pastors in hell, deacons in hell. John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered him. I love this. this. Nicodemus comes and says, hey, we think you're, we, we, you might be the real deal. And Jesus just gets in his face. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is what? Born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. If you're not born again, not only can't you get into the kingdom of God, you can't even see the kingdom of God. So question, question for you. Why do we all know our physical birth date so well when we were barely aware of anything at the time? You're like, what do you mean? We weren't. You're like, I was there. Of course you were there. But you don't remember it. You don't remember it at all. Why not? Well, a bunch of reasons. But, you know, <laughs> one of them is you, you didn't have a vocabulary. You know, you would think that when you're in this beautiful, wonderful, warm, liquid environment, la, 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 not a care in the world, all of a sudden you hear, oh, oh, push, push. Like, uh, uh, I'm getting squished. Oh, no. And all of a sudden, poop, you come out and you're, you're all wet, it's cold, it's bright, you've never seen lights like that, and you know, some doctor flips you upside down, whacks you on the butt so you can breathe, ah, and you're crying, and, you know, and then you, the, 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 you hear this woman screaming and cussing her husband out, ah, I hate you, and all this stuff is going on, you, <laughs> that's your entrance into the world, but you don't have a vocabulary, 
you can't even, you can't even think because you don't have a vocabulary. You know, if you had a vocabulary, you could go, oh, crap. But you don't know crap. So you don't have those. You don't remember when you were born. If you tell me you do, you're a liar, all right? I'll point you to Revelation 21.8. But we all know our physical birthday. Rare is the person. I know one in my life that doesn't know because he came from a wackadoodle home, doesn't know his birthday. We all know our physical birthday. How come some of you don't know your spiritual birthday? Hmm? How come you don't? Because maybe you don't have one. Because I, I, I know every, I can remember after I was born, I can remember when I was born, but I remember things. I remember when I was five at a Christmas production. My sister was up there. She was two years older than me. In a Christmas play, and they're playing la, la, la. It was the Christmas production, you know. Ha, ah, I'm a lollipop. Ah, whatever they were doing. And so she's up there, and I'm sitting back with my mom and dad, you know. It's a little community. It's nice. It's wonderful. But I'm in kindergarten, and there's a girl that I'm crushing on, and she's sitting up in the second row. And there's a seat next to her. And so I'm like, hey, Dad. Hey, Dad, can I go sit next to Judy? Judy Slaybaugh. Still remember her name. And he goes, all right, boy, be good. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't talk. I won't talk. So I went over, tick, 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 sitting next to Judy, and they're doing their little lollipop thing, you know. And then I look over at Judy. She's looking hot. She's a hot five-year-old. <laughs> Put my arm. You know how you do, guys. Mm. She does not disagree. So I thought, well, let's take it up. And I leaned over and started macking on her. Mm, the next thing I, <laughs> next thing that happened, it was the rapture. I was airborne. My dad had come over and he just went, oh, he's a big dude, grabbed me, just woof, and put, took me back like a wet puppy all the way, slammed me in that seat. I start crying like a girl. Everybody's laughing. They ain't paying attention to the lollipops. They had them a show. I remember that. Remember all the big events in my life. Remember when I got married. So this is the biggest event of your life, and some of you are like, yeah, you know, I, I'm, it was some time. I don't know. I think I might have been seven. I don't know if I was 12. I'm not sure. Well, dear Lord in heaven, what in the world? You better get, you better get one. You better get a, a spiritual birth date because you might not have one. And so ask yourself right now, right here, have I personally met Jesus? Have I personally met Jesus? Do I have a testimony of meeting Jesus? You need that, a testimony. Proof number two that I'm really a Christian. Now I'm obeying Jesus. Now I am obeying Jesus. When Saul meets Jesus, man, his life, boom, it's, it's totally changed here in, in uh Chapter 9 of Acts, back there, he went on his way. He approached Damascus. There's this light from heaven. Uh, all of a sudden, it's shown around him. He falls to the ground. Here's this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. I'm giving the orders in your life, and you hear no arguments from Saul. No arguments. God just rocked his world. He met the eternal son of God face to face, had his eyeballs seared, and now he realizes from now on things are going to be different in my life. Jesus is going to call the shots in my life. And wow, wow, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. And look where else Saul immediately obeys the Lord Jesus. Some of you need to key in on this. This is huge, and you haven't done it immediately before he even ate. He rose and what? Was baptized because he realized what baptism signifies. Doesn't save you, but shows that you are saved, shows that you're proud of Jesus. Can you say, some of you can't, I've obeyed him in that first faith step and been baptized? Well, John, baptism is not all that important. You know, it's kind of optional. You don't know your Bible then. You just showed your spiritual ignorance. Saul thought it was important enough to do immediately before he even ate or drank. That's how important it was. Jesus was baptized before he preached one sermon or did one miracle. As an example to us, well, baptism doesn't get you to heaven. No, but it's one of the proofs you're going there. It's what it shows. It's, an, it's commanded to show that you're not ashamed of Jesus and his church. It's like, I, I love the illustration, it's like a wedding ring. 
You don't have to be, you know, have a wedding ring to be married. I can't get mine off. All right. All right, I'm still married. Didn't just get a divorce. Okay? But this shows what? Come on, come on. Married. Proof taken. Proud of my wife. Proud to be married. Why do dudes who are in dudettes, who are going out and trying to, you know, have their God of town on a business trip, decide to have a fling, you know, the spouse won't know anything about it. What do they do in the bar? Take off their ring. Because they don't want to identify as taken. Some of you don't want to identify as taken, do you? Well, I, I just didn't know it was a big deal. It is. It is. He spends a lot of ink talking about it. It shows you're not ashamed to be identified with Jesus. Some of you are ashamed. Question, are you ashamed? Here's where some of you are ashamed. You haven't done it in so long. You've been here in this church for 15 years, and everybody thinks you're cool and copacetic and baptized, and you've not been baptized, and you don't want to admit it. That was me after I trusted Christ here as a young sailor. Didn't go long, maybe a month at the most. But when I joined, they baptized me by immersion. Everybody thought I was cool. And then about a month later, I trusted Jesus. And I'm like, let's be very quiet. And then the Holy Spirit said, are you ashamed of me? I'm like, dang it. So they had old velvet curtains. The curtains opened up. And there's John Houston. I'm already doing stuff in the church, teaching, you know, a, a young, young uh, adult class. And they're like, what? And so some people might go, what, to you? But everybody's going to go, yeah. Amen? So hit the QR code, you scallywags. And get baptized next week. Next week's baptisms. All right? So join the crowd. Here's the secret real quick. Romans 7, 22. It says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Some of you don't delight. And I get it. Well, you know, before I came to Jesus, I didn't delight. I, I liked the Bible. had the Bible. You know, I had several Bibles. And all I would say, I respected the Bible. I did not delight in the Bible. And, but I delight in the law of God in my inner being. What does that mean? In my saved soul. That God is, is well, let, let's say it this way, up on the screen, obedience to Jesus comes not from the human heart, but from a heavenly hand. He comes in and changes you, gives you desires for his desires, his will. The proof that I'm really a Christian, I'm now obeying Jesus. I have a desire. It's not from me. I didn't just get more religious. I got Jesus. And his Holy Spirit's living inside me. And he's working from the inside out, changing this old boy. Amen? So if you need to be baptized, hit that QR code before you leave here and sign up to be baptized next week. Gut check question. Is the basic tenor of my life obedience or is it disobedience? Some of you, it's disobedience. Number three, how I prove to myself and others that I'm really a Christian. And these are coming straight from the Scripture, right? This isn't John making up stuff that he just wants to say. And there are more, but these are the ones that are here in Scripture. Number three, I want to hang around Jesus' kids. I start wanting to hang around Jesus' kids. In, in Acts 9, verse 26, when he'd come to Jerusalem, he wanted to join the disciples. And so he finally does. They finally say, yeah, he's really real. They tested him. So then he goes in and out among them. So every time the doors are open, he's there. And then he's also serving and ministering in and through that church. Whenever they had church, Saul is there. When it's raining, Saul is there. When he had a bad day at work, Saul was there. When his football team lost on Saturday, Saul is still there. When all the other kids had sports leagues, Saul was there. Just messed with some of you there. Before I met Jesus in the Navy barracks room, I did everything I could to avoid church. I did, even though I was raising it. Because now I'm an adult, man. You know, I got a holiday routine on Sunday. That's time to sleep in. I don't want to go to church. Didn't have a desire to. I would when I went home on leave just because, you know, that's what was expected. And I liked the folks, but nothing special. After I met Jesus, personally, in my barrack rooms in the, in the Norfolk Naval Shipyard there when I prayed by myself, something changed. I couldn't get enough of this. I couldn't give it. I, I bought a car so I didn't have to hitchhike. We were hitchhiking to church. That was no fun. And, and so I, I bought a car for the express purpose of driving to church and not having to hitchhike. And then I thought I could bring other guys. And so I had a sunbird, a Pontiac sunbird, not a firebird, a sunbird. It's like a little firebird. And so <laughs> we squeezed eight sailors into that sunbird from the shipyard all the way over to Portsmouth where this church used to be. I fell in love with this church. I still love y'all. 
I do. There's only a few of you who've been around since the old days, but I do. And I, I wanted to hang around Jesus' kids. My life was being changed. And basically what it was was, what is it? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. What do you do? Oh, you open the doors and you see all the people. Some of you just learned something today. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> Obedience to Jesus comes not from the human heart but from the heavenly hand. And so if you don't have these desires, I get it, I get it, neither did I because I didn't have Jesus. So if you don't have these desires to come, like, no, let, let me just jump in some of you, you, you Easter folks. Can I get in your grill? You folks who show up at Easter Sunday once a year, maybe Christmas, twice a year, what does that show to you? What does that show to you? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to help you. Careful, John. You offend some of them. They'll never be back. Dude, I got one shot. I got one shot at some of you a year, if that. If you think you're okay with Jesus, but you don't give a rat's patootie about hanging with his kids, the desire's not there. I get that. I get that. That was me. The, the Bible says your faith is not the saving kind. Now, if you're just checking out the church for the first time and you just wandered in here, then okay, I'm not probably talking about you, but you Easter lilies, come on. You know who you are. And if I offend you, okay. I'd rather offend you and get you thinking, hey, maybe the dude is right. Maybe I'm not really a Christian. I need to do something about that. I better make sure and trust Jesus because this is my one shot with some of you, and I'd rather take it and obey Jesus and give you a clear warning than to tickle your ears in the hopes that you'll like me and maybe, maybe, maybe come back again in 364 days. So when you really love someone, you spend as much time with them as you possibly can. When our ship was lit off, we were just out of the shipyards then. I was a new Christian, and I had started dating uh, uh, Robinette, and I fell in love with her. I fell in love hard, that girl that I first met at this church. The reason I kept coming back to this church, because I didn't like this church, but I liked that girl. And then I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then we're lit off. We're going to go to Guantanamo Bay for a shakedown cruise, which is no fun. And I am going to spend every waking moment with her. We're on 12 and 12, 12 on, 12 off. And so the 12 off, I drove from the, the shipyard, and I would drive and, and straight to her daddy's house. And he didn't like seeing me, but I didn't care. And I would come in there and spend time with her. And I was up 36 hours at this time, 36 hours. And I'm just, oh, I'm exhausted. And, but, you know, she knows I'm showing my love. I want to be with her. So she's got me on the couch, and my head is in her lap. She's doing my hair. I'm almost asleep, and she goes, like you ladies do, do you love me? <laughs> and I said, and I'm not bare, you know, I'm, I'm popping no dose, so I'm just in a weird, weird environment. And I'm like, yeah, I, I love you. But then I, I don't know why. I said, and I love Mary. <laughs> now, you're like, Mary, yeah. And, and I don't know where that came from. I really don't. To this day, I don't. I was, I was, I was drugged up. But Mary happened to be the girl that dumped me on my first cruise, whose name is tattooed on my arm, <laughs> that Robin saw. And then she goes, and I didn't, and she goes, Mary, and then it hit me, alert, alert. <laughs> and then I said, you know, by the Holy Spirit's power, I said, and I love Joseph and the baby Jesus. <laughs> To this day, she doesn't believe that I was talking about Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. <laughs> so, what do I want to talk about? I want to be with the one I love <laughs> if I love him. And John 13, 35 says, by this, all people know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. What's he saying? Real quick, if I don't love my Christian family, then I have the proof or evidence that I'm still lost in my sins and don't know God. You might be fond of them. You might like them. They're okay. But I'm talking about a love that the Holy Spirit, the unseen hand of God, puts in your heart and soul and starts changing you, like he did with Paul, like he did with me, like he did with many of you. And then how I prove, are you keeping track uh, 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 that I'm really a Christian? I, I got a testimony, number one, of meeting Jesus. Now I'm obeying Jesus. I want to hang around with Jesus' kids. And number four, and we're almost done, my lifestyle shows I'm being changed by Jesus. 
My lifestyle shows I'm being changed by Jesus. Look at these changes in, in Saul's life. Immediately, he rose and was baptized. Boom, he's changed. Immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. He just, he just, just doesn't say, well, I'm going to get baptized. He says, I'm going to talk about it. He's the son of God. And Saul increased the, all the more in strength, he's growing as a believer, he's changed. And then he went in and out amongst them. He's, he's in the church all the time. The dude is being changed. Well, John Saul's just kind of a super unicorn saint. No, 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 no. It, it's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You ought to memorize this one. It says, if anyone's in Christ, anyone, he's a new creation. Anyone. He changes you. It might look different in your life than it does mine. But there are going to be some commonalities. So are you? Are you a new creation? Or are you basically unchanged? How do you stack up when you come face to face with these proofs? It's, it's, it's not you doing religious stuff. Get that. It's God's spirit in you driving real change, which brings the proof, proof that God's spirit is in you. And one last scripture, and we'll, we'll, we'll land it. And that is this one. And it's a sobering scripture. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ, what's this? Does not belong to him. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, it doesn't say have religion, doesn't say you have church membership or even baptism. It says if you don't have the spirit of Christ, trusted Jesus, you had a personal relationship with Christ. But it says if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You're either you here or anyone. You're one or the other. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him, and so you don't go to his heavenly home, and you end up in a place called hell that a lot of folks don't believe really exists but does. And are you trying to scare me? Dang right I am. Dang right I am. If I, again, if I had died in the shape I was in, all religious but lost, a poser, not meaning to be a poser, I'd be in hell today. Question, you got the proofs? You got the proofs? If not, many of you do not right now get Jesus. Get Jesus. You feel the drawing, yearning, compelling in your hearts right now. He is drawing you to himself. Do not disregard that. God, I pray that you would do an amazing, amazing work in the lives of folks here. Lord, may they get Jesus. May they get reality. May they quit this church membership, baptism stuff. All those are important, but if they don't have Jesus, it's nothing. Nothing. It's posing. And so, Lord, I pray that you would grab a hold of hearts. Right now, right where you're at, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, real quick. Where are you at? Do you really have Jesus? Do you have the evidences of having Jesus? I guess I should say that. Do you love God's people enough to try to be in God's church? Whether this one or another one? Do you have a changed life that people can go, wow, yeah, remember what you used to be, man. Ha, look at what God did. Do you have a testimony of meeting Jesus? I mean, really meeting Jesus? If any of these you're like, ah, I'm not so sure, then man, why don't, why don't you make sure, make, make Easter Sunday 2024 the day when you meet Jesus. The day when he saves your soul. Writes your name on the Lamb's book of life. How do I do that? You, you don't have to do anything. He's done everything. What do you do? You accept what he's done. Accept what he's done. Right now, right where you're sitting, draw a circle around yourself. These aren't magical words. Do not pray them if you don't mean them. But if you mean them, the Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You get enough faith to call on him, believing that he's the son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. He went to that grave. Three days later, he rose victorious, which we celebrate today. He says, I'll save you. Because I, with my blood, purchased your salvation. All you got to do is say, yes, I want that. So right now, why don't you say yes? Just say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, tell him that. I know I'm a sinner. Tell him that. No excuses. But right now, as best I know how, I'm trusting you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe you are God. Tell him that. And I know you'll save me if I ask. And so I'm asking Save me not for anything good I've done, but by the blood of Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. Your death, your burial, your resurrection. And I believe if I ask, you will save me. And so, Lord, today, 
I'm asking. I'm asking. Save my soul. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, all right? No one looking around. I'm not going to point you out. But I do want to rejoice with you, all right? And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You shouldn't be ashamed to say, yeah, man, I prayed and I trusted Jesus. So with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, just raise your hand up, hold it up. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, all across the other term. Yep, keep them up, keep them up. I want to I pray for you in a second. All right, keep them up, keep them up. All right, keep them up while I pray for you. Lord, I, I pray for these folks. God, I pray that, that, that it was genuine that they prayed, that they meant it. And Lord, that you will do amazing works in their life and help them to show the result of really meeting Jesus. And help us to help them out any way we can, Lord, as the church of God here at Point Harbor. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.